organ here at the cathedral was initially installed at Old St Paul's, which is, was the cathedral initially. Um, it was built by T.C. Lewis, who is one of the top organ builders of the day. Uh, when the cathedral here was opened, it was moved across and was rebuilt in the 80s uh, by a company called Croft, when it was hugely enlarged, um, almost tripled in size. Um, it was such an expensive undertaking that the company actually went bankrupt as a result. Um, so we've ended up with a huge instrument, quite a, a varied instrument, um, and it's now really showing its age, so we're actually looking to have another major rebuild. Um, like any expensive bit of machinery, it needs regular maintenance and rebuilding. Um, when it was reinstalled, we had a new, at the time, computerized system installed so we can save all our registrations and flick through things at the push of a button, which is very convenient. Um, this organ's got 61 speaking stops. Um, a stop is a set of pipes. Each one has its own individual color and character. Um, so this organ has four manuals and a pedal board as well. Um, most organs, the typical church organ, has two manuals and pedals. This one has four. Essentially, each manual or keyboard is an organ by itself. So we have different colors for each manual. So the grate is the one we use for him playing mainly. It has the most power. It speaks cleanly into the building. We have the swell manual, which is called the swell the, because the pipes are enclosed in a box called the swell box. And with a pedal, we can open and close the shutters to give us a crescendo effect. Um, we also have the solo manual, which again is enclosed in a swell box. And this has colorful solo stops on it. as well as some very loud reeds. And the fourth manual is the positive organ, and this is really sort of German Baroque colors. So each of the manuals can be used individually or they can be combined so we have different colours being combined together. Each of these stops fall into three broad categories. The most known one is the diapason, which sounds like an organ basically. These are usually metal pipes which um, have a mouth at the front and a open at the top. The difference between the diapason and a flute stop is simply that the flute stop has a stopper on the top which changes the harmonic makeup. So it's a much rounder, fatter sound. The third kind is my favourite and that's the reeds. Now on the organ we call trumpets reeds even though they're obviously not in the orchestral instrument family. Um, they're called reeds because each pipe actually has a metal reed at the base of the pipe. So we've got trumpets of various kinds. We've got loud ones. Quieter solo ones like the clarinet. or my favorite, which is called the Vox Humana. And this is meant to sound like the human voice. But really it's more like a pack of goats. So this is inside the swell box of the organ. Um, explaining before that the swell box is basically an organ all by itself. So there are many different ranks of pipes in here which are enclosed in the box with shutters here. So these shutters can be closed, which is like closing a bedroom door so less sound gets out. And then with the foot pedal we can open it, which gives us a crescendo effect or subtle changes in dynamics. Up here we can also see the three types of pipes I was talking about 
before, we've got diapason pipes, which are these ones here, which look just like organ pipes, and they sound like you'd expect, expect an organ to. Um, so these have a little mouth at the front, and they're open on top. Flute pipes look almost exact, exactly the same, except they have a stopper in the top as well, which changes the harmonic makeup of the pipe. Flutes are also often made out of wood, like these lovely pink ones across here. The other kind of pipe you can see here are the reed pipes, and I can't show you the inside of it because I would get told off if I did. Um, but these are the reeds. The wind comes in at the bottom of the pipe, makes the reed vibrate, and the tuning pin, which is up there, attaches directly to the reed and changes the length of it. And the top half of the, of the pipe doesn't affect the pitch, it just affects what kind of noise it makes. So this is one of the bellows for the organ. Down in the crypt we have a blower, which creates a huge amount of air. Each set of pipes needs a different amount of wind pressure, so we've got several of these around the chamber. Um, and essentially it's like the bag on a set of bagpipes, so how hard you squeeze it affects the amount of air pressure coming out. So the weights on top control very precisely the air pressure going, going to that particular division of pipes. This is the brain of the organ, essentially. Um, coming from the console on the other side, there's you know, a great fat cable, individual strands for every key and every stop, which comes here and is then split out throughout the organ. Um, this is now an incredibly old-fashioned way of doing it. These days it would be connected with a Cat5 network cable going to a little black box. Um, but this is how, how, it's, how it was done when it was built. Um, the biggest issue we have is every pipe has a little transistor. And if one of those fails, it's searching for a needle in a haystack trying to find out where the fault is. Wake up here is a real privilege. Um, I get to work on one of the best organs in the country with one of the best choirs in the country and in the most glorious acoustic you can imagine. Um, the most challenging thing about working here, or in fact playing any organ, is making it sound musical, because essentially it is one large machine. Um, every other instrument you play, you have direct control and direct contact with the instrument, either with your breath or your fingers or you know, actual physical contact. Um, so it feels a lot like playing like remote control. So Make it sound musical is one of the challenges which I absolutely adore. It's, you know, it's good for the brain, it's good for the soul. I couldn't really be happier.